Hello folks, hope you are having a wonderful start of your week. We are on Tuesday and that means it is time for another delve into some more lore. If you like what I do, the subscribe button is down below. Let's help grow the channel. And if you really like what I do, the absolutely brilliant notification bell is next to that. If you don't click that, you'll never know that I'm here. And if you really, really, really like what I do, then head on over to the Patreon. If you become a patron, you get early access to all of our videos. You get messages back and forth with me. You get access to the Q&A that I'm going to try and do once a week so we can have a little conflab together. And you get access to the premium part of the Discord, which is the Astral Backers part of the Discord, where we can have a little chat together and I, I hang around most days. The Discord itself is free, so, you know, don't worry about that. But, uh, yeah, it's only that one little bit that's siphoned off so I can talk to people on a more one-to-one -one basis. Anyway, the Iron Warriors. Yeah, it's about time, innit? The Iron Warriors are, to be honest, my favourite legion. And I'm going to be completely down pat with you guys. Even if it's Loyalist or Traitor, the Iron Warriors are the ones who speak to me the most. And, and think about that what you will. No one marries the ice-cold stoicism or, or intelligent and frosty Astartes grit with the actual down-to-earth weariness like the iron warriors do right that they, they encompass all of these different things that we sort of take for granted in 40k or 30k in that we have these um beautiful heroes and things and, and, and this and that or golden warriors but who who are in the dirt we like, need marines that are in the dirt doing a bit often they are the butt of many jokes within the 40k community for their sheer saltiness the iron warriors are also one of those strange legions that due to them being rather niche in terms of interest, they win quite a lot in the lore, and have been given breathing room to do some pretty insane things. This happens quite a lot, and I'll get into it a bit later on, but this does happen quite a lot in the lore, where if you have a legion like, um, I don't know, well, the Iron Warriors are the perfect example, who aren't really given that much love by gamers, Games Workshop will all, all, almost give them a power boost in the lore, to bring them up to the level of everyone else, which also means that they get away with some really, really crazy things. So, let's get into them, see what makes them tick, stick, and what we would change to make them fit into the lore with a bit more elegance. So, the good first. We always start with the good, don't we? The Iron Warriors are left alone for the most part, as they are not one of the popular legions, or one of the most popular legions with the fan base. They do their job at the Siege of Terror and leave. Their actions in the Horus Heresy and Great Crusade do nothing but build their character. I've got a few examples here. We have Perturabo actually tricking Lionel Johnson at the start of the Horus Heresy, of all people, into giving him weapons of mass destruction. It's idiot writing, but still. You know, nobody gets one over on the lion, let's be honest, in terms of, like, pulling the wool over his eyes. Perturabo manages it. He actually convinces the lion to give him some, like, like world-ending weapons that he then uses on East Van 3, I think, in the Dropsite Massacre. You know, it, I, name me another Primarch who could do that. And I, I will doff my cap to you. We also have Perturabo beating down Angron, even in demon form. Not man on man, okay. But by outsmarting him and using his rage against him. Outsmarting him? <laughs> outsmarting him and using his rage against him. So, that uh, that one example is Perturabo using the way that his legion works to annihilate the world the, the world eaters. To, to basically t pull Angron's army apart piece by piece isolate him, and then beat him down to within an inch of his life. That is the, probably my favourite passage of uh, Perturabo lore ever, is that part, because it shows every cool thing about Perturabo's psyche. He's not in it for the glory. He's not in it to make sure that everybody knows his name and that he, he builds these massive, uh, massive empires in the name of his father. He's in it to do a job. And that's what I love about him. He's there to just do a job. And his job is to put a collar on Angron and bring him to the Siege of Terror. If Perturabo is not at the Siege of Terror, it doesn't happen. Right? The Traitor Legions at this point are so disparate and so, um, you know, interseen against each other, that if the Iron Warriors and Perturabo are not there as the backbone, the Siege doesn't take place at all. It's a wash. That's how... The, they are the glue of the traitor cause. They are literally the glue of the traitor cause. And they don't get any credit for it. But that also links back in to the elegance of their writing 
because of course they don't get any credit for it. They're the Iron Warriors, right? No one gives them credit. That's why they're salty as F. We even have the Iron Cage. I mean, the Iron Warriors do really get their cake and eat it in the Horus Heresy and beyond. You know, the Iron Cage being the, the incident after the Horus Heresy where literally <coughs> Percherabba builds a massive big fortress and says, come on, Dawn, dig me out. Come and get me, you know? Outsmarts him again. And Dawn knows he's being outsmarted, but he's, he's played like a fiddle. He's been played like a fiddle. He has to go as, as, as a seek of honour to basically go and try and get Percherabba out of there. Of course, Percherabba is not even there. And he ends up decimating the one legion that really sticks in his craw. He gets everything that he ever wanted. And he does it underneath the radar. He does it so much that nobody really picks up on this. And this is why I wanted to make this video so much. Because I've always wanted to say this. And I know I have on the channel once or twice. But those videos haven't done that well. So I've been really wanting to say this when people can see it. They, they are the most successful legion. Out of anybody. The Iron Warriors are the most successful legion in... in any of the Imperial forces. Do they do most of their conquering in the horror, uh, before the Horus Heresy in the Great Crusade? No. No. But they are the linchpin around which the Great Crusade spins. Sorry, the Horus Heresy spins. They are the linchpin around which Horus is able to build his traitor cause. And once they are removed, his cause falls apart rather quickly. As a Primarch, Percherabo is one of the most fatally misunderstood all he wants is recognition for his skills and an acceptance from his brothers that his cold nature will never allow. It's the beautiful dichotomy of his character and the fact that through his bitterness, Percherabo gets what he wants. And that is a cruel irony. Let's be honest. When he gets what he wants, does he even really want it? I'd say no, because what does he want? He wants to rule. He wants recognition. Well, Right now in the 40k universe, all Percherabo has is the recognition of sycophants and people and hangers-on. He doesn't have the, the, re the recognition of the people that he actually wanted it from. I actually think he wanted it from Rogel Dawn the most. Which is why he hated him the most. He wanted that recognition from him the most. And he's never going to get it because his own bitterness, his own saltiness stops him from getting it. He stops him from being close to people. The only person he can he can manipulate is Lionel Johnson, another loner, right? Lionel Johnson's social skills are rubbish. He doesn't have any, right? That's the whole point of him. He's secretive. He doesn't have any. And, the, and he's the only person Percherabba can get to actually go, you know what? This guy's all right. This guy's fine. And it's all a lie. How tragic is that? Poor Perty. I really do feel for him. All he wants is to be loved. His legion also embodies the will of iron that makes up their Primarch and their own personalities. These blokes, the Iron Warriors, were used as siege fodder long before Percherabo came to them. And when he did, he ordered their decimation. A cruel reward for their sacrifices. This is a last culling of the weak within the legion, according to Percherabo, wiping away those he deems are holding the legion back by traumatizing his remain remaining warriors into obedience. So, unlike almost any other legion, the Iron Warriors are decimated when they find their Primarch. One in ten of them are killed by the other by the other nine tenths. That is a brutal way. It was a brutal punishment in Rome, and it is a brutal way of introducing yourself to your legion and how things are going to be from here on. You can imagine that the joy of finding their Primarch finally where they might not be in one of these sieges that they're always getting ground down in, and all of a sudden they see their Primarch is a siege incarnate. How shitty must have that feeling have been. <laughs> but it just turns them ever more salty and ever more of with a will of iron. The Iron Warriors are what the Astartes sorely lack. Dogs of war. Men in the mud, doing the hard yards and forming the engine room of the Imperium's greater conquests. If you look just below the Lion, Sanguinius and others that are standing on their in their heroic poses, they're doing it on the backs and sacrifices of men like the Iron Warriors, which is why I like them so much. Their scientific expertise is a wonderful nod to their cold nature. The Iron Warriors are not duelists. 
They are not even warriors, really. They are war artisans. They pick the weakest mathematical point in an enemy wall and hit it with every body, bullet and shell they have until they're through. This is what makes them of such high appeal to scientists of all shapes and sizes in real life. I know several scientists who love the Iron Warriors and play Iron Warriors. To the, disen to the disenfranchised and often overlooked and to war gamers in general. Okay? Nobody really plays the Iron Warriors, but everybody likes the Iron Warriors. That is a big point. Even I don't play the Iron Warriors, but they're my favourite legion. I play word bearers in terms of our legion, right? But I like the Iron Warriors more. <laughs> That's right. Percherabo and the Iron Warriors in general play Warhammer together. Read up on it if you don't believe me. They, all, they move electronic pieces around a board representing the legions and how they would defeat them in battle. If that's not Wargaming and Warhammer, I don't know what is. This is also a real commentary from Games Workshop towards their audience and what they look like to them. Which is kind of like how Clark Kent sees humanity. So, let me just get into that segue for a minute here. Out of Superman and Clark Kent, which one do you think is the costume? Well, obviously you're going to say Clark Kent because you're trying to be clever. But most people would say Superman, right? Most people would say Clark Kent is the real person and Superman is the costume. Well, that's not true, right? Superman is Superman. His costume is Clark Kent. He tries to blend into humanity. So how does Clark Kent act? How does his alter ego act? He's cowardly. He's sniveling. He doesn't have a backbone, right? He's a nerd. That's quite a put down, isn't it? When you see how, how how Superman truly sees humanity. I think that's quite quite a dark thought. Well, it's the same for the Iron Warriors. If you want to know what Games Workshop think of war gamers in general, just read Iron Warriors lore. You'll know. You'll know. That and the Red Scorpions. Iron Warriors and Red Scorpions are the two that are basically the uh, the yin and yang of war gamers. Well, not the, not the yin and yang. They're both the dark side of war gamers. They, they take the two really bad parts of wargaming, like, you know, the saltiness, the the almost arrogance of being good at a game that no one cares about, right? Wanting recognition and, 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 and love from people, but being too salty and angry to actually get it. If that's not a wargamer, that, that, I mean, that is, isn't it? Let's be honest, we're all wargamers here. We've all felt that way. Let's admit to it. The Iron Warriors are a very, very, very good mirror to hold up to wargaming in general. As are the Red Scorpions. The Red Scorpions, if you do not know, are the Forge World only chapter. And so they're, they're for Forge World only people. And what are the characteristics of the Red Scorpions? They're obsessed with purity. They're obsessed with having the best stuff. They're really arrogant because they have all of the best stuff and the richest war gear that nobody else can seemingly afford. Is this not hitting any vibes with Forge World people to you? Right? Games Workshop do it all the time. But, and even though it's really horrible as like a put down to the wargaming community, it's still elegant writing and I love it. I love elegant writing. And that is a huge, huge, huge doff, and, doff of the cap to the Iron Warriors for doing that. They're, they're, they're awesome. So, since I've sucked their dick for a while, let's get into some bad, shall we? <clears throat> In terms of the bad, the early years of Percherabo are a bit of a mess, if I'm being completely honest. Whilst his world of Olympia has some trappings of ancient Greece, it never actually does anything with them. And the ancient Greek culture was one built on heroes and heroic stories. The Iron Warriors are not heroes. Perturabo is not a hero. He may want to be loved and respected like one, but that's not who he is at his core. Primarchs should always have an incredible link, an indelible link, to their homeworlds. And I do not think Perturabo really ever fits with his own. This plays into his story well, don't get me wrong. But I still think that he would be better served by a backstory that actually uh, actually links these things together. The Imperial Fists and Iron, and Iron Warriors step on each other's toes far too much for my liking. Don't get me wrong. We should have this rivalry as it's hilarious. It's just I think it's 
born of a silly place. The Imperial Fists are the best defenders the Imperium has, and the Lunar Wolves are the best attackers. The Iron Warriors are, what, good at sieges, so they, they hate the Imperial Fists, who get all the credit for sieges? Is that really the juvenile level we are playing at here? I think the Iron Warriors deserve far better in terms of a motivation for hating the Imperial Fists. The Iron Warriors have no reason to return for the late game shenanigans in the, war in the 41st millennium. Really, every traitor legion should, ha should have unfinished business, and I don't think the Iron Warriors actually do. Especially Perturabo. He has everything he wants. Why would he want to come back? In a world where we want to bring back all of the greatest heroes, the Iron Warriors have no real reason for coming back. They just don't. So, what would I change? Let's get into it, shall we? After a quick sip of tea. Lovely stuff. So, a few controversial things, because as I love the Iron Warriors, this is going to sound really counterproductive, because... The thing that I don't like about the Iron Warriors is what is right at, the, right at their core at the start. Their homeworld and their early history and where they come from, right? So, the Iron Warriors in my, in my lore are renamed to the Iron Sworn. They're the only legion with a name that sounds like a, like a mercenary company. Because that's basically what, how they act. They don't see themselves as Iron Warriors. No, no, they're, they're, they're just the Iron Sworn. Most call them the Iron Hounds. I think it fits better, as the word warriors just doesn't fit the nature of the Legion. They're not warriors. They're not swordsmen. They're not there to, like, duel with people. They're not warriors. They're mercs, right? They're salty, salty sea dogs. They're down in the grit of the entire 30th millennium trying to fight wars that are much bigger than they are. They're the Iron Sworn. They're sworn to the act of having an Iron Will. Alright, so. The Iron Sworn homeworld is known as Riken. R-A-I-K-E-N. A more German sounding word. And is under constant pressure from its own moon. Krieg. Yes, that Krieg. As the two worlds fight over the exploded remains of another moon that stands between them. This exploded moon is full of rich ores, and so and so constant spaceborne sieges take place that home both sides into absolute beasts of siege warfare long before the emperor even turns up. Right. So the so the people from these worlds have mastered like relatively short range space travel even before the emperor turns up. Perturabo forces a stalemate between the two sides and brings the world to, worlds together. To do what? To fight off the Imperium as it lands. He is the only Primarch to defeat the Emperor's forces as they land in open battle, forcing them to retreat from Riken's surface and basically accept defeat. They're that good at sieges. His men are that good at sieges that they can't... They, they, they disappear under the surface. And let, let's not forget, imagine the iron will of the Iron Warriors combined with the absolute sheer suicidal fanaticism of the Death Corps. That's unbeatable. As long as one of them's still alive, the siege isn't over. There's billions of them. They're unbeatable, right? You, they, even if you virus bomb the entire planet, they'll just go underground. They prepared for this day for debt for millennium at this point, for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. They've, they've prepared for this. Their entire culture is built around the last siege. The last siege being when this alien force comes to wipe them off the earth. They've all been preparing for this moment their entire lives. And here it is, right? And Perturabo forces a stalemate that brings everybody together. Both worlds are war-torn and resemble the battlefields of World War I at this point. But with massive catacomb cities underneath the surface. The people are fanatical in their desire to cast off the aliens and regularly hurl themselves into certain death to turn back this false emperor, quote-unquote. Finally, the emperor turns up in the flesh to right the situation because he recognises that one of his sons is on the planet's surface. When he and Perturabo meet on the field of battle, Perturabo recognises the emperor using his latent psychic gifts, because he does have them, 
and accepts him, right? He knows exactly who he is. Perturabo is logical. He knows now the Emperor is here. The jig is up, right? The jig is up. And he also knows the Emperor is his father. So, thinks, wow, here is my opportunity to be accepted. He, he bends the knee to him. And as the commander of the Twin Worlds forces, they go with him to the Emperor's side. Because they are also very logical. If Perturabo is kneeling to this guy, this guy must be good, right? So the Twin Worlds, as we call them, Riken and Krieg, they are accepted into the Imperial Fold as massive mustering stations for the Emperor's, for the Emperor's armies going forwards. The rest of the Horus Heresy plays out like it does in real life. The Iron Sworn are not appreciated. They are used to crack open the deadliest and nastiest of sieges. The Planetary Defense Force of the Twin Worlds is organized into something called the Death Corps. Yep, that's them. A fanatical unit of humans who do not make the grade to become Iron Sworn. Slowly, a rivalry starts to develop between the, the Iron Sworn and Death Corps. I bet you see where this is going. Iron Sworn, in this setting, are the best in the Imperium for attacking strongholds. Yes, the Lunar Wolves are still the best attacking overall, but the Iron Sworn are the best for bringing down defences and ending sieges very quickly. The cost to their Legion, though, is massive when they do this. This leads them into a natural rivalry with the Imperial Fists, as on some worlds the Fists brought under compliance, rebellions break out once they have left. The Iron Sworn are brought in and smash the defences and end the rebellions rather quickly, cleaning up the mess, quote-unquote, left behind that by the Imperial Fists, and not being shy about telling them how easy their wills were to break down. Iron Sworn Salt at the best of times, right? That's where the rivalry comes from. So, the Iron Sworn are often sent in to deal with things when, when, when things have gone wrong, to break down Imperial fortresses that have gone over to the enemy side. And some of them are naturally the Imperial Fists. Nobody else really cares about what they leave behind. They're just conquering worlds constantly. The Imperial Fists do, though. They care. They nurture the worlds that they leave behind. And so when certain worlds fall to rebellion, because, you know, the Imperial Fists are now gone and they're not there anymore, the Iron Sworn are the ones who turn up to right the situation. And they're not shy about reminding the Imperial Fists, you're supposed to be doing your job properly, and here we are clearing up your mess. Saltiness. That's what they do best. When the Horus Heresy breaks out, the Iron Sworn side with Horus, but the Death Corps of Krieg remain fanatically loyal to the Emperor. The Death Corps in the Horus Heresy do not wear gas masks, but are, but, but are experts in trench and siege warfare. They are the only army the Iron Sworn cannot break down, and it drives Perturabo completely insane. In fact, the Death Corps commander sorry, the Death Corps commandeer, and send several capital-class ships into the fault lines of Riken itself, annihilating the planet and causing the near destruction of their own world in the process. Because it's in, it's in the close vicinity to an exploding planet, right? In anger at their insolence, and after two years of constant fighting, Perturabo nukes Krieg before leaving for other battlefields. The Death Corps, however, survived below the planet's surface. They don gas masks to walk to the surface, which now looks like a kind of stalker shadow of Chernobyl. You know, that's what it looks like on the surface these days. The Death Corps become expert trench warfare guys, yes, but also radioactive rangers able to brave impossible odds and radioactive poison. When the Battle of Talarn comes around in the Horus Heresy, the Iron Sworn deploy en masse only to find that across from them stands the united Death Corps of Krieg once again, returned from the dead, seemingly, leading the Imperial tank charge against them and setting up trench positions that go on for thousands of miles. They intend to hold Talon until the rest of the Imperial forces get there to relieve them, and they succeed. Once again, they foil the Iron Sworn, despite their losses being hundreds of times higher than the Iron Sworn's. Talon ends in a narrow Loyalist victory. 
The Death Corps are devastated by this victory, however. It, it, it is a true... How do we put it? Um, a true... Not phallic victory. Oh my god, that's, that's the wrong word. Hmm. You know. Py Pyrrhic victory, that's the one. That's what I'm looking for. It is a true Pyrrhic victory. Not phallic victory. It is a true Pyrrhic victory. So that, you know... Uh, Epir uh, uh, sorry, the King of Epirus once said, you know, look... If we win many wars like this, many more battles like, like this, we'll lose the war because we're losing so many men. That is essentially what the Death Corps of Krieg are in this setting. They've lost so many men at Talon that they can't fight in the rest of the Horus Heresy. And they don't have the numbers to be on terror for the siege, but the Iron Sworn do. The Iron Sworn have won many battles in the Horus Heresy, but cannot seem to finish off the Death Corps of Krieg, who keep losing so hard that they end up winning. That's the law of the Death Corps. They lose to the Iron Sworn so hard that they win. <laughs> Finally, a grudging respect starts to develop, although it's quite one way, from the Iron Sworn to the Death Corps. That is based in a lot of, of Gallows' humour. So, you know, the, the Iron Sworn are very dour and very dark in their sense of humour. And so they actually kind of like see the Death Corps as like a, a budding, how do I put it, mascot. You know, of course they're hard as nails. They come from our home world. You know, that kind of a thing. The Iron Sworn annihilate the Imperial Palace. And once Percherabo's usefulness is at an end, he is abandoned by Horus on the surface to die as Horus duels the Emperor. The traitor legions turn on each other, uh, fleeing to the Eye of Terror. But Percherabo forbids his legion from following because following chaos is a sign of weakness. That's right. The Iron Sworn, the Iron Warriors in this setting, don't follow the Chaos Gods. Instead, he moves throughout the galaxy, annihilating forces on both sides, Imperial and even Chaos, should they cross him. As he seeks to gain the power to build his own empire that will truly eclipse his father, so now is the time he wants to build his empire to eclipse what's come before, because he thinks that's the way he's going to get acceptance. And in the end, he does so. Far off into the unknown stars of the northern quadrants of the galaxy. There, he raids Xenos technology and begins being a, being a constant menace for the, dark, for the Blood Angels and Space Wolves in that region of space. When Abaddon invades, sometimes Percherabo aids him. Sometimes he stands against him, depending on, 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 on his whim and his needs. Finally, the Iron Sworn are loyal to nobody but themselves. But one day, they will have a reckoning, reckoning with their brothers, both mortal and otherwise, and gain the last, laughs, the last laugh on their worth. So, that is what I would do with the Iron Warriors in the current setting of Warhammer 40k. They are still salty, they are still angry, they are still really beyond good at sieges and breaking people down. The Iron Cage still happens, right? All those things still happen. Most of the lore that we see in Warhammer still happens. Because I love it so much. We just change the origin of the Iron Warriors. We change their name. We change what their, what their culture is all about. We take away the ancient Greek trappings because they don't really need them. And we mould them into this cold-ass scientific mercenary force. They would basically be what the Red Corsairs try to try to be. Right? That they would be what, what the Red Corsairs attempt to be. That's how I would have the Iron Warriors. Anyway, what do you guys think? Do you think I've gone too far? Do you think the Iron Warriors are fine as they are? I wouldn't mind you if you did. Let me know what you think in the comment section down below. I love you a long time. I will see you tomorrow on Wednesday for some more Hobby Nightmares. I will see you then. Have a wonderful rest of your day. See you later. Bye.